sponsored by the James Madison Council. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the 2021 National Book Festival. I'm Michelle Hussein, author of The Skills from First Job to Dream Job, What Every Woman Needs to Know. And I'm delighted to be speaking to Adam Grant about his latest and again, very successful book, which is called Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. So welcome, Adam. Thanks for being part of this. Let's start, Adam, with the wonderful theme of this year's festival, which is open a book, open the world. Take me back to your childhood. Was there a book that opened the world to you? There were so many. It's hard to pick just one. But I remember being in elementary school and my mom taking me to the library and letting me pick out 30 books a week. And I just tore through them. Uh, reading was an invitation into somebody else's mind. Uh, I remember just getting transported into stories and being lost in the world that was created by the author. And one of my favorite books that I read in elementary school was The Westing Game. Uh, it was a mystery. And I remember reading it and having all these hunches and guesses about what was gonna happen and being shocked at the ending. And then I read it again because I wanted to see if I could figure out uh, what some of the clues were that the, authors, the author had planted that I missed. And that discovery process just, it reminded me that the most powerful thing about opening a book is that it opens your mind. Uh, it leaves you qu to question the things that you think you know. Uh, and I cannot think of a better time to do that than 2021. Did you say 30, three, zero books a week? <laughs> they were short books. Yeah, but I, uh, I, I spent a lot of hours reading. And I, I think that for, you know, as a shy kid who's very introverted, um, a reading a book was a way to connect with other people without all the discomfort and awkwardness of having to approach someone for a conversation. Interesting. But I still think I'm starting to understand why little Adam Grant grew up to be Adam Grant of today. Um, you know, I grew up in the Middle East as an expat um, kid in the United Arab Emirates because my parents came from um, Pakistan first to the UK and then moved to the UAE. And there were no public libraries that I can remember and very few bookshops, actually. This was the Middle East in the 1970s, at least in the Gulf, there were very few. And there was one little library in our um, in our sports club. And that was where I pretty much feel like I read the whole children's section. And, you know, in that sort of, you know, dusty weather, the same all year round kind of environment, that was that was absolutely where starting with Enid Blyton or Louisa May Alcott, you know, the world didn't open up to me. So I feel like I owe so much to that tiny little collection of books in a in a building that I'm sure no longer even even exists. But, you know, these things help make us who we are. They so, do. And I don't know if the pen is mightier than the sword, but I do believe that it's ink lasts longer. And I think that, you know, for so many of us, books have changed our lives and yeah. they've also changed the world. And yeah, I know for a long time people were wondering, well, is is digital or is audio going to replace cracking open a physical book? And I think the resounding answer is no. There is yeah. nothing like sitting down with a book and actually yeah. reading it. And here, here we are. are. Here are our contributions to um, to the to the collected literature that is out there, and primarily we'll be talking about yours. Um, now, this. I've got lots of questions about this, um, Adam, but why don't you start out with, with your core argument? Because a lot of your audience are high performance individuals, high uh, performance organizations as well, and your work is incredibly influential amongst those groups and beyond. What, were you, what is the core argument that you set out in this? Well, I think the basic premise is that being smart enough to be good at thinking and learning sometimes stands in the way of rethinking and unlearning, right? The more intelligent you are, the more reasons you can find to convince yourself that your beliefs are true, that your opinions are accurate, that your assumptions don't need to be questioned. And that's not a problem if the world stands still, right? If we're in a stable world, the beliefs you held yesterday are probably dependable today. But we live in a dynamic world where everything around us is constantly changing. And that means that there's a danger of our old beliefs becoming mental fossils. Uh, that they need to be discarded and abandoned. And we're pretty reluctant to do that. I have watched so many companies fail, not because they were bad at thinking, but because they were bad at rethinking. Uh, let's go with uh, Borders, Blockbuster, 
Kodak, Sears, Toys R Us, BlackBerry, right? All of these organizations uh, fell in love with their visions and their strategies. They got too attached to the old ideas that made them great. And they didn't start to think again until it was too late. And so what I'm really interested in is how we can find the curiosity, the humility, and the courage to question our old ideas. But aren't a lot of your readers, those high performance people, wouldn't you say a lot of them are, I mean, they're in the kind of places where you where you are challenged. Um, you know, you have to be on the top of your game. I mean, assuming they're not going out of business, aren't they to some extent doing what you're saying already? I, well, first of all, I wrote this book for everyone. So I'm not going to assume that, you know, that only high performers or high achievers are going to read it. But secondly, and maybe most more importantly, uh, I think that in many cases, uh, they are rethinking, but they're doing it too slowly. Uh, I think the idea is that, you know, that we actually want to be quicker to think again. Uh, we, need to, we need to challenge our assumptions proactively. And if, if there's anything that 2020 taught us, right, it was that we were too slow to do that. Uh, we, I had I'd had data for for decades, right? That as long as people were in the office half the week, that you could get more productivity, higher satisfaction and retention, and there wouldn't be a real cost to collaboration and relationships. And yet, so many of the leaders that I worked with were reluctant to even run a remote Friday experiment and let people work from anywhere one day a week. And one of the things that I see consistently, and this is true for leaders, it's true for uh, for parents, um, it's true for teachers is we get stuck too often thinking like preachers and prosecutors. When we go into preacher mode, we believe we've already found the truth and we're trying to proselytize it. When we're in prosecutor mode, we're trying to win an argument and prove our case. And the problem with preaching and prosecuting is you've already decided that you're right and they're wrong, which means they might need to change their mind and think again, but you're good. And those mindsets can stand in the way of rethinking. However, if you find a method, a way of working, a system of processing information that works well for you, and I'm thinking as an individual here, in an organization, you'd probably call it a best practice. Um, you've discovered that works for a reason, and it's kind of tried and tested. But is it a dangerous thing to try and hold on to? I think it can be. Uh, some of the work I've done with NASA, for example, suggests that so-called best practices can cause a space shuttle to explode or to disintegrate, right? You get too attached to the way we've always done things and you don't question old routines. I think the danger in a best practice is it creates an illusion of an endpoint. There's nothing better than best. We've already reached perfection, so we don't need to rethink it. I think what we should be doing instead is looking for better practices, asking, is there an opportunity to improve this? And knowing that the way we did things before may not apply to the current circumstances. Okay. Any practical thoughts about how you do that without um, throwing the baby out with the bathwater or without throwing your organization into, you know, complete change, which is really stressful for everyone? Yeah, that is scary. I think the first thing to recognize is that rethinking does not have to change your mind. It just means being open to reconsidering and reevaluating. And you might conclude after some careful analysis that the way you've always done things is effective. I think though that what I often like to do is draw two by two. I wanna ask how high are the stakes of this decision? How important is it? And then also how reversible is it? Can I easily undo it? Where you need to do your rethinking up front, where you wanna question your best practices quickly is when the stakes are high and the decision is irreversible because it really matters and you can't just change your mind tomorrow. And that's when I think we need leaders to pause. We need all of us, right? As we make our life decisions, our career choices, our decisions about where we're gonna live. Um, we wanna pause on those high stakes decisions because we, we can't just course correct immediately and quickly. Um, and we wanna do lots of rethinking up front. If the stakes are lower or if it's easy to change your mind, fine, act quickly and do your rethinking on the back end. What really interested me uh, in your work with NASA when I when I read the book is that's exactly the kind of place because of the safety implications, you know, like the airline industry as well, more widely, where I would imagine that that kind of um, constant rethinking is par for the course. Well, it, it is in many parts of NASA. Uh, the question is, what do you do when there's serious time pressure? Uh, so if you look at the, the decisions that NASA made around the Space Shuttle Columbia launch, uh, Columbia launches, and then there are some pieces of foam that are seen floating around. And the question is, well, we've recognized those. Uh, 
what do we do about them? And NASA's best practice at the time was to focus on the next mission. Right? If you launch a shuttle successfully, you have you have accomplished your goal. And they didn't put enough uh, enough focus and enough attention on asking how do we make sure that these astronauts can return to Earth safely. Uh, and as soon as they shifted their attention to the next mission, uh, they missed the opportunity to rethink what could that foam loss mean. Um, and ultimately, the reentry into the atmosphere proved disastrous. And one of the things that NASA has done uh, since that tragedy is they've tried to create the psychological safety for people to ask each other things like, how do you know? How do you know that the foam loss isn't necessarily going to be catastrophic to the current mission? And as you ask those questions, right, it reminds people to realize what they don't know, <laughs> to question whether they've made some assumptions that need to be tested and investigated more thoroughly. What are the other surprising examples of organizations or companies where, um, where, where, where you've seen that they could do better in this regard? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> where, where to start? I think one of the, the saddest examples that I've studied just from a, you know, a, a sheer consumer love perspective is BlackBerry. Uh, when, you know, when RIM launched the BlackBerry, they completely changed the way we communicate, right? All of a sudden, we were able to send emails from anywhere. Uh, we were able to, to connect with people in different ways than we had before, and they basically ignited the smartphone revolution. And then they got a little bit too attached to the features of the BlackBerry that had made it successful in the first place. Uh, they, they said, you know what, we want to create a device that's going to allow people to send work emails. And we have millions of customers who are passionate about this, overlooking the fact that there were billions of potential users who wanted a mobile computer right, for home entertainment, not just for work email. And in doing that, they refused to rethink the physical keyboard, which, by the way, I still miss. <laughs> but uh, they didn't want to try the touchscreen. Uh, they just kept saying, we don't get it. This doesn't work. This is not our way. Uh, they invented a messaging platform uh, that very well could have been WhatsApp, uh, but they didn't make a big investment in that until it was too late. Um, and the, the amazing thing to me is that they were thinking like scientists when they built the BlackBerry. Right. They they were they were running all kinds of experiments to figure out how we could make a device work this way. Um, but they stopped thinking like scientists. They went into preacher mode and into prosecutor mode when it came time to rethink their basic strategy. And uh, they went from having about half of, of major market share in North America uh, to essentially zero in the span of a few years. Yeah, that is a really sobering tale. Um, let's let's come right up to date, Adam. And. Um, think about the the pandemic or post hopefully post pandemic workplace. Um, where do you think we are on um, hybrid work models? Uh, I mean, do, do you think we're going to end up in in a way like the Monday to Friday week is a kind of you know settled accepted thing? Do you think we end up with a fairly settled understanding of what hybrid work models will look like, or do you think there'll just be huge variety? I hope there's huge variety. I, I think it would be a, a travesty if leaders started making commitments now when we have so much to learn. This is the worst time to make a commitment. It is the best time to run more experiments. And I think when, you know, when it comes to running experiments, uh, one thing we, we know from research pre-pandemic is that it's pretty helpful to have some flexibility, right? There was an experiment at CTRIP, a call center in China, where people were randomly assigned to work from home, and then there was a control group. And the people who worked from home on average were 13 and percent more productive. They were half as likely to quit. And part of that was because they didn't have to commute. They took fewer breaks. They took shorter breaks. Uh, they appreciated the flexibility and that brought lo loyalty and response. Uh, they were grateful um, and motivated because of that. And I don't think we wanna take that away. But there are all sorts of questions about how to make that work because despite being more productive, they were less likely to get promoted. They didn't have face time with senior leaders. And I think there's a real concern that in this hybrid workforce that we're, we're going to move into, that some people who are in the office more often, even though they're not necessarily contributing more, are going to have more opportunities for learning, for growth, for mentoring, uh, for advancement. And we obviously need to figure out how to solve that. My read of the data right now is that in the US, people are expecting to spend about 20% of their work time not in the office, uh, which roughly corresponds to one to two days a week for the average person. 
Um, I'm seeing a lot of companies say, okay, we're in the office Tuesday through Thursday. You can work from anywhere Monday through Friday. Um, and I would, I would be really sad <laughs> if, if companies stopped there and said, okay, this is the model, three days on, two days off. Different jobs, different cultures, different teams are going to find different approaches that work for them. That question of, of doing the new model, implementing the new model with equity is such an important one because you could imagine that largely it might end up those being those with caring responsibilities um, or, you know, which will be largely women being the ones who are at home. And as you say, not presenting in the office, not getting the face time, not being promoted. Yeah, and that, that paradox, I think, is amplified by some recent data. There was an experiment published recently where people actually got to alternate between working on site and remote. And the people who benefited the most from being remote were working mothers, exactly as you anticipated. Uh, they got the biggest productivity boost from having the flexibility to work whenever and wherever they wanted. And yet they are the very group that's most likely to be disadvantaged by not having that presence and face time with senior leaders. And we have to do something about that. Yeah. Any thoughts on what that might be? Do you have recommendations of your own? I, I think it's it's pretty early to have answers, but I, I definitely have questions. And, and one of the questions is, uh, have we considered the possibility that if even one person is, is going to be on Zoom or micro, Microsoft Teams, that everyone is, uh, that we're either all in the office for a meeting or we're all going to be signing in online for a remote meeting? I wonder if that's an example of the kind of equalizing mechanism that we need to test out. Yeah. Or maybe even the group that happens to all be in the office within the bigger meeting are all individually on Zoom so that there isn't the sense of some people in a in a meeting room together and everyone and, and the others scattered around by Zoom. Yes, please. And while we're at it, let's let's start measuring people's contributions uh, as opposed to whether they manage to make a good impression on senior leaders. You wrote a piece in the New York Times the other day that got a lot of attention um, where you talked about this idea of languishing. What did you mean? Well, I think we need to rethink what mental health and well-being means. And I kept hearing from people that they were having trouble focusing and concentrating. They were talking about being in pandemic fog. And as people describe this, I realized I was feeling some of this too, uh, that I used to bounce out of bed in the morning, excited to, you know, to start my day. And I was kind of laying in bed, playing word games or uh, watching Netflix shows. I'm like, why am I doing this? And as I thought about it, I realized we're not burned out. We still have energy. We're not depressed. We still have hope. But a lot of us were feeling sort of joyless and aimless. And I realized there's, there's actually a term in psychology for this. It was coined by a sociologist, Corey Keyes. It's called languishing. Languishing is that feeling of blah or ennui or meh, where you've, you just have a little bit of a sense of emptiness and stagnation like you're looking at life through a foggy windshield. And I have never had so many people read something I wrote and, and say, I feel seen, like I am languishing right now. And I, I was actually surprised by how energized people were to talk about their lack of energy. But the, I think the interesting thing about languishing is um, it interferes with focus. Uh, so we know that when people are languishing, they're about three times more likely to cut back on work. Um, it's also a risk factor for mental health. Um, as, as bad as depression is, one of the functions that it often serves is it prompts people to either seek help or help themselves because they know that something is wrong. Whereas with languishing, it's more subtle. Um, you don't have any, any symptoms of mental illness. It's more like just the absence of mental health, right? It's, it's sort of your, your peak well-being is missing. And so it's easy for you to be indifferent to your own indifference. Um, you might not noticing the, you know, the dulling of your delight or the dwindling of your drive. And some of the research on languishing shows that people who are languishing today are actually at greater risk for major depression 10 years from now than the people who are currently depressed. Um, and it may be that languishing sort of stalls action. So I think recognizing languishing as an emotion is important. Right? When you name it, you realize, okay, this is a real thing. I'm not alone. And now I can start to take action to do something about it. And I think that's the next big question is, how do we get from languishing to flourishing? Do you think that it is largely a phenomenon of working from home and that disconnect or sense of isolation? I don't. I think you know, humans have languished as long as, uh, as, long as we've, we've lived. Uh, I think that languishing is, you know, that feeling of being stuck is often a product of your circumstances. And right now, during a pandemic that seems never ending, 
um, we all feel stuck, right? In some ways, um, it feels like the world is standing still and it's hard to, to have the sense that your own life is moving forward um, in that, that broader context of stagnation. Um, but the, I think the data on languishing would tell us that you know, if, it's a, if it is a feeling of stagnation, that one of the best antidotes to stagnation is a sense of forward movement. And research on, on happiness and daily joy suggests that the single biggest driver is a sense of progress. Uh, that to get out of languishing, we don't necessarily need big moments of success. We just need small wins, um, a sense that we've accomplished something little. And I think that's why so many people have found solace in learning to cook, um, in you know practicing a hobby or a skill like learning to play the guitar. Um, for me, it's word games, right? Those are those are moments where I have these tiny jolts of I was able to achieve something today, and now I feel a little bit more of a sense of mastery. Uh, I feel a sense of, you know, of meaning that I was able to solve a problem. And I also feel like I matter because I'm connected to the people who I'm playing with. Uh, and I think more of those moments are going to help us make progress out of that muddling through. So now, because I was going to ask you about your own pandemic experience. Now I know that word games were, were a big part of it. And I guess also getting the book finished. I mean, that, that must have been a big job in the midst of all of this. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't expect the book to be so timely. Uh, I started working on it in 2018, having no idea that there was going to be a global pandemic that forced us to rethink so many assumptions that we'd taken for granted from, you know, can I possibly get work done while well, all three of my kids are home in online school to is it safe to eat indoors in a restaurant to can I hug people outside of my immediate family. And I think if 2020 was the year that that forced us to rethink my hope is that in 2021 and beyond, we do our rethinking more proactively and more deliberately. And one of the best ways to do that is to get out of this mode of preaching and prosecuting and into thinking more like a scientist. When I say think like a scientist, I don't mean that you have to go out and buy a microscope or a telescope, right? Although I, I would enjoy it if more people dressed up like Bill Nye. But when I, when I say think like a scientist, I mean, don't let your ideas become your identity. Uh, look for reasons why you might be wrong not just the reasons why you must be right. Listen to the ideas that make you think hard, not just the ones that make you feel good. And surround yourself with people who challenge your thought process, not just the ones who agree with your conclusions. And I think this is a huge mistake that so many of us are making on social media right now, is we follow people because we think they have the right answers, as opposed to saying, let me follow people because I, I respect the integrity of the questions they ask and the way they explore them. I think like a scientist is a really useful one, uh, like a, a takeaway to, to help put into practice what, what your book says, because experiments start with a hypothesis, which may or may not be borne out. That's exactly right. And there was a great experiment with Italian startup founders who were randomly assigned to learn to think like scientists. Uh, they were just taught your strategy is a theory. Uh, when you talk to customers, great way to develop hypotheses. When you launch a product or service, that's an experiment to test your hypotheses. Over the next year, they brought in more than 40 times the revenue of the control group. And the major mechanism was they were more than twice as likely to pivot. Uh, the entrepreneurs who didn't learn to think like scientists, they got stuck in a trap of escalation of commitment to a losing course of action. Uh, they launched a product or service. It didn't work. Instead of rethinking it, they doubled down because they wanted to convince themselves and everybody else that they were right all along, right? They preached the virtues of their old plan, they prosecuted their naysayers, and they got themselves stuck in a bad strategy. Whereas when they were taught to think like scientists, entrepreneurs said, oh, my experiment didn't work, let me go and try something new. And they were much quicker to think again. And that kind of flexibility, that mental agility is what we need more of in the world. As you look back on your own ideas, the things you put into your books earlier on in their career, are there, are there some which you have completely rethought yourself? Oh, there are so many. Where do you want to start? Uh, one of the ones that I, I think I got completely wrong was uh, in, in a previous book, Originals, uh, I recommended that people should have strong opinions weekly held. Uh, and it's, it's a popular phrase in a lot of parts of the world where people say, okay, you should fight passionately for an opinion. And then if you find out it's wrong, you should abandon it quickly. Well, I no longer think that's a good strategy. Um, I, the overwhelming evidence on, on this topic is that if you express an opinion strongly, you are not likely to abandon it quickly because as you, as you talk yourself into it, you're gonna become more extreme and more entrenched, right? There's, a, there's an old um, 
an old translation of the phrase uh, of the word abracadabra. Uh, apparently it comes from the Aramaic, which means I create as I speak. Uh, and it is, it's a dangerous act right, to express an opinion strongly that you don't want to hold strongly uh, because you are persuading yourself in the process. But you're also signaling to other people that you are closed, that you've already formed your conviction. Uh, if I make a strong argument for a point of view, then the message is that I'm not willing to open my mind. So I now believe that if, if, you, if you think an opinion is tentative, you ought to express it tentatively. Uh, and this really flies in the face of the way that I've communicated in a lot of the debates and disagreements that I've been in. Uh, I've been accused of being a logic bully <laughs> where I just bombard people with data, with reasons. And that of course leads them to, if I'm in prosecutor mode, it leads them to come to the argument with their best defense attorney and neither of us opens our mind. What I've started doing now is I've started coming into disagreements saying, you know what, I have a bad habit of being a logic bully. I don't wanna be that person anymore. So if you catch me doing that, please call me out. So and usually the other person will, will then come back and say, you know what, I have a bad habit of being really stubborn and I don't wanna be that way either. And we both committed to a little bit more curiosity and humility. And then sometimes they do call me out and I can course correct before I've completely lost them. So that idea of communicating an opinion tentatively is a good one, is it? I mean, it's where you can kind of test your, your arguments and meet others in the middle. I think so. There's, there's research on expert negotiators and what differentiates them from their peers. And one of the findings is they actually, um, they, they present their proposals a little bit more tentatively and they, they back them up with fewer reasons. Uh, because they don't want to dilute their own argument uh, and they want to learn from your reactions. And so instead of saying, here's the belief that you should adopt immediately, uh, and here are the nine reasons why it's going to make sense, I want to come in and say, you know, here's a perspective that I think is interesting. What do you find compelling about it? And what do you think might not be accurate about it? And then as I hear you reason through it, I can actually learn something from your viewpoint. I can also then begin to tailor my arguments to the kinds of perspectives that you might find persuasive. Adam, thank you very much. We're nearly out of time. I just wondered, um, I mean, obviously your book has just come out this year. You're going to spend a lot of time um, focusing on, on that. But what does the second half of this year look like for you? And have you already got a thought for the next book? <laughs> I, I don't know yet. Uh, there's, there's an experience that you've had, I'm sure, Michelle, which every author has of you wish you could go on the book tour before the book is turned in. Uh, because I've, I've rethought a bunch of things that I wrote and think again, which... I guess it would be ironic if I didn't, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that, that I, wanna, I wanna spend more time on is figuring out what we should rethink quickly and what we should rethink more slowly. I think that when it comes to assumptions and opinions, we should probably be as quick as possible to discard those because they don't, they don't usually have a strong, a strong foundation of evidence or experience behind them. But when it comes to our knowledge that we've worked hard to develop, uh, we probably shouldn't throw that out at a moment's notice. And especially when it comes to our beliefs and values, right, that, that are pretty formative in defining our identities, we might want to be a little more cautious with those. And I think the risk is that people hold on to those beliefs and values um, in the very situations where they need to question them. And so one of the things that, that I'm planning to do in the second half of this year is uh, I've actually scheduled a checkup. It's a little bit like going to the doctor, even when nothing is wrong. Uh, you do that once or twice a year. I think we should do the same thing with the important decisions in our lives. To pause once or twice a year and ask, uh, do I have the right values? Um, am I actually prioritizing those in my daily life? And have I encountered any experiences or any data that might suggest it's time to rethink where mm -hmm. I want to live, uh, who I want to spend my time with, uh, or what kind of work I want to do? Um, and I think having that structured occasion, that scheduled moment to reflect, is a great way to pause without having your life in constant flux and saying, oh no, I have to rethink my principles and who I am on a daily basis, which is probably not a healthy way to lead a life. A conversation with yourself, you mean? Think this is an hour I'm gonna spend twice a year really taking stock of who I am and where I am. Exactly, when I, when I did this last year, one of the things I realized was um, one of my core values for a long time uh, since I was in high school had been hard work. And I kept learning, including from my own data, that sometimes putting things off and procrastinating could actually help to incubate creative ideas. And it forced me to rethink that, that value of hard work. 
And what I ultimately realized was the value I hold is excellence. I care about trying to, to do things as well as I can. Um, and sometimes hard work is the, the path and sometimes it's actually an obstacle to excellence. And that was a great reset for, for one value that I'd been too attached to. And I had gotten into judging myself if I thought I was, you know, I was lazy on a given day. Um, I had, you know, I'd, I'd, I think I'd been too hard on other people uh, who were, you know, reasonably pausing, actually investing in resting and rejuvenating. And now that I know the value is excellence, uh, it's a lot easier for me to extend compassion to others and also to turn it inward. Adam Grant, it has been a pleasure. Congratulations on your latest book, Think Again, and best of luck for the future. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I hope you don't rethink your enthusiasm for this idea of thinking again. Definitely not. I'm scheduling my own, you know, where am I in my life checkup immediately after this. Uh, Try it at your own risk. I hope it goes well. <laughs> Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation, and now we'd like you to hear more from the library's own experts on this topic. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Ellen Terrell, and I'm a business reference and research specialist in the Science, Technology, and Business Division. The Science, Technology, and Business Division is responsible for technical reports, science, industry, technology, business, and economics collections that account for approximately 40% of the Library of Congress books and journals. These subjects were part of the original collection of the library and were also represented by volumes related to agriculture, chemistry, economics and commerce, and Thomas Jefferson's personal library that was used to reestablish the library's collections after the War of 1812. One area of business that has a longer history than you might think is self-improvement books. As author and organizational psychologist Adam Grant discusses, it is important for organizations and individuals to be open to new ideas and avoid becoming complacent. Rethinking and challenging your own assumptions can lead to greater success. The interest in improving oneself, particularly as it relates to achieving success in the business world, is not new. In the late 18th century, Benjamin Franklin published Advice to Young Tradesmen, other writers and thinkers look to religious principles for guidance, and many of those from the 19th century, like Samuel Smiles, were concerned with developing character traits like duty and honor. Over time, authors began to develop their own programs or systems, and like Napoleon Hill, wrote about lessons to be learned from successful businessmen. The lines between books on self-improvement and job success began to blur. Books on career counseling, borrowed from those on self-improvement, while books on offering advice on job success borrowed from those titles that were more motivational. Motivational and self-improvement books branched out and became more focused, looking at how to start a career, how to make money, and what to do or not to do in business. One example from 1922 is The Do's and Don'ts for Businesswomen by Jean Rich that is filled with advice on various topics that might be of use to the many women who were entering the workforce. It offered advice on being a self-starter and knowing your business tools, as well as the importance of being able to answer the question of would you hire yourself. The Library of Congress acknowledged the title of this genre in their list of 100 books that shaped America when it included one of the most famous titles, Dale Carnegie's 1936, How to Win Friends and Influence People. More recent titles you might recognize are Who Moved My Cheese, Norman Vincent Peale's Power of Positive Thinking, and Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This year's National Book Festival theme is Open a Book, Open the World. And while self-help books may have been about improving oneself, ultimately they have also been about opening one's world.